Well, Pastor Falwell, it is such an honor to speak with you today. Um, you do such important work, and you're a pastor in addition to leading university. And we're in a difficult election year, and so many pastors are struggling with how to address difficult topics from the pulpit. How often do you address social issues from the pulpit, and what is your perspective on that? Well, you know, I think as a pastor, we have a responsibility, first and foremost, to preach the gospel. Uh, obviously to pull from the Word of God truths that can help people know how to navigate not only their own spiritual life, their own spiritual journey, but also to navigate the things of life, the, the situations that take place outside of the church and outside of their own spiritual journeys. And obviously that brings into play a lot of the social issues, it brings in a lot of the political issues. Uh, you know, as a pastor, my goal and what I do all the time, I talk about the issues. I focus on issues. I don't focus on political parties. I don't focus on political arguments or Republican, Democrat, left, right, whatever it might be. But I do talk about the issues that are important to people of faith, the issues that flow from the Word of God. When you're teaching the whole counsel of God, you're going to talk about life and you're going to talk about family. You're going to talk about religious liberty and freedom, all of these kinds of things that are at the forefront of our political landscape and the divisiveness that seems to be so prevalent in our culture today. So with that being the case, we, I just talk a lot about issues. And when you're talking a lot about issues from a biblical perspective, as it relates to how we can apply God's word and God's truth to the issues of the day, you don't really have to delve too far into the issues of, you know, this candidate or that candidate. Basically, I just tell people, you know, hey, find the individuals that most closely align with biblical truth, with what you believe, or what you believe God's word clearly teaches you. Find that person, get behind that person, support that person, and vote for that person. And that's something that very clearly we need to be focused on uh, in regards to our Christian faith, living that out day by day. And so I talk about it often. I don't have like series throughout the year where you know I'll take a you know six weeks and talk about political stuff. Mm -hmm. It's just throughout the years I'm teaching from any book of the Bible. There are elements that come to play that that deal with things of the culture. Mm -hmm. What is the answer for America amid? a moral decline. It seems like chaos is just getting worse. What's the answer? Well, the first thing we need to recognize is 2 Timothy chapter 4, uh, you know, in chapter 3 and chapter 4, Paul tells us in the last days things are going to get worse and worse. So the first thing we have to do is recognize that we don't need to be surprised that things are getting crazier every single day. We shouldn't sit back and be shocked that the world is moving further and further away from truth and further and further away from God. We need to just simply recognize that the answer, as it has always been, is the gospel of Jesus Christ. To continue to preach the gospel, that he's the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through him. And the more time we spend focusing on the truth of the gospel, it seems like the more people's lives are changed, the more impact is being made. And so, yes, obviously the world is crazy, the country is getting crazier, the, you know, the, the arguments that go back and forth, and I often talk to our, our, our congregations at the church, our students at Liberty, and you know, tell them, yes, I mean, the arguments that seem to be flying all the time, I, I don't get caught up in that stuff. Just continue to live your life, live your faith, live your journey, share the gospel, live it out day by day. Make sure that you know the hypocritical Christian is never a label that can be put on you. Like when you preach the gospel, make sure you're living the gospel, loving God, loving others. And when we do that, I think that's the answer to the challenges that we face day by day. I think that's the answer that we will have to, to truly recognize how God can use us to make a difference and to change the world. Yeah. Now, Pastor Falwell, how do you define Christian nationalism, and is there such thing as good Christian nationalism and bad Christian nationalism? Well, so honestly, I'd rather focus on the first part of that statement rather than the second part, and that's to be a good Christian. And a good Christian, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 22, to love the Lord your God, but love your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then he said, the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. And so when you recognize that as a, a true believer, as a follower of Jesus Christ, who is living out the principles that, that God gives to us through his word, what naturally is gonna flow from that is you're gonna be a good citizen. And you're gonna be a good citizen who loves people from the right and from the left. You're gonna be a person who uh, impacts people with good, that you're gonna make a difference and make an impact, that you're not gonna see color, you're not gonna see you know, ethnic backgrounds, you're not gonna see you know, whether they're from this persuasion or that persuasion. What you're gonna see is a person for whom Jesus died and rose again. And when you're living out that kind of faith, 
That truly is the kind of person, the kind of citizen that I think every Christian ought to be, is the kind of person who recognizes that God has put us here to be salt and light, but to do it in a positive way because Jesus made it very clear, love God, love your neighbor. He said, love your enemy, whoever it might be, to simply love, to reflect the love of Christ. The first Corinthians chapter 13 kind of love that never fails. It doesn't keep a record of wrongs. That is not boastful. It's not proud. It's the kind of love that shows what Jesus was and who Jesus was when he walked on this earth. And if we can do that, to be honest with you, I think the, the, the divisiveness and the, uh, the strain that comes along with that statement of Christian nationalism, which naturally has a negative connotation that comes with it, it, it goes away because it becomes less about making sure that, you know, I'm right and everybody else is wrong. And it becomes more like, hey, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ and I'm gonna do what he's called me to do, and I'm gonna love people the way that he's called me to love them, and I'm gonna share with them the gospel that, that Jesus died, that he rose again for them. And if we live that kind of life, I think it kind of takes that argument out of the, out of the picture. Yeah, absolutely. So in a, in a sinful, fallen world, sometimes we're forced to choose between the lesser of two evils. And I think that's something that a lot of Christians are faced with, particularly in an election year. If we choose to withdraw, are we contributing to the greater evil? Well, obviously, as I said a few moments ago, um, we have a responsibility to find people that most closely align with the biblical truth and our values and that will espouse the kind of truths that we believe flow from the Word of God. Obviously, all of us are humans and all of us are flawed. Uh, I've heard my dad say many years ago before he passed away, he said, honestly, he said, I, I've never met anyone that I think is the perfect candidate. In fact, he said, in fact, I don't think that sometimes I could even vote for myself because I know myself. Because sometimes as a human being, we do things that don't honor uh, our commitment to Christ and, and the walk that we have because we have a sinful nature. So recognizing that we're all flawed, recognizing that you're not gonna find a perfect candidate that's gonna be absolutely in complete alignment with everything that you believe and everything that you want that person to be, then it does lead us to the point is we have to find the individuals that are gonna most closely align with what we believe and what we believe God's word teaches and what we believe is best for our nation. Uh, certainly there are a lot of biblical values that come into play, but there also there are some practical values that have to do with issues such as uh, you know our, our connection to taxes and you know all of the things that are not biblical in nature, but yet still practical in nature. And so, yes, we do have to recognize that we're not going to find a perfect candidate. You're never going to find a perfect candidate. You go back and we lionize some of the great leaders of the past, and whether it's a Ronald Reagan or whether it's a you know a Kennedy or a Roosevelt or whatever it might be, we look back and we think, man, they were so awesome. And then you read their biographies and hey, these guys were flawed too. You know, these are people who who messed up. And so I think it's important that we do get involved in the process. I do think it is a duty uh, of Christians, of, of followers of Christ, to stay engaged. Jesus taught us that on several different times in scriptures and his teachings. Uh, Render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. So in the passage where he's talking about how he told, tells Peter to go down and, and go fishing and pull the fish out, there's a coin in the, and pay that as the tax. Like He told us to stay engaged. We need to be engaged. We're never gonna find the perfect candidate, but we do need to find the person who most closely aligns with what what we believe and support them and vote for them and pray for God's blessing. Yeah. Now shifting gears a little bit, you lead uh, the largest Christian university in the United States. I'm so curious what you think the future of pre-collegiate education is in the U U.S. And do you believe the church will need to start taking more power away from the government? Well, I think that statement, taking power away from the government, I think that's a you know, that's a false narrative. I don't think we can do that, obviously. A church can't go in and take power away from the government. That probably will not work out really well. But what we can do is we can provide alternatives. We can go in and provide, my dad, you know, started uh, back in 1967, a Christian school that was connected to our local church, a K through 12 school that it still is in existence today. We have over 2,000 students. And it is a school that, you know, it's fully accredited, all the excellence, all of the academics that are there, the, you know, all of the uh, pre-enrollment classes for uh, graduate degrees, degrees and in college, those types of things, so students can get the best possible education. But to get that kind of an education from a biblical perspective, and I think that is so, so important. Day by day, we read stories in the news. So we see stories of, of, of school districts and, and, and different uh, states that are putting into play and putting into the curriculums things that 
that truly are going to destroy the young people of our nation. And so I think it's very important that, that we stay engaged and whether it's from a homeschool perspective or whether it's from a Christian school perspective, my prayer is that there are churches all across the country that will start as they did back in the 60s and 70s that once again, they will start Christian schools in their churches. Many churches, uh, you know, their, their buildings are full on a Sunday, uh, on a Wednesday maybe, but throughout the week, they're not as full. I, I would love to see students, whether it's like a homeschool co-op or whether it's a, a school, a, a church-sponsored school, where we can actually prepare the students and, and provide an alternative to some of the craziness that is taking place in the public schools where kids are not being taught the, the basics and the foundational truths of, of academics, but rather they're, they're being infused and their, their lives are being, in, you know, kind of infected, if you will, by these kind of ideologies that flow completely away from the truth of the Bible, the truth of God's Word. So we can provide those, those alternatives. Uh, obviously, going into, you know, colleges, uh, lots of great schools in our country today. We also have seen, in the past few months even, uh, we've seen some of the things that have been infused into the college experience where uh, students are being taught things in classes that, that, that certainly are not part of the true academic experience. And so I think it is important. I'm a firm believer in Christian education from you know, preschool all the way to the PhD of being able to get quality and excellence at liberty. My dad always said, and we continue to make sure that we focus on it every day. If it's Christian, it ought to be better. Excellence in academics, excellence in facilities, excellence in athletics, all of the things so that not one Christian student, not one young person would ever have to sacrifice to go to a Christian school, sacrifice the experience of being able to get the best, but they get the best from a Christian worldview. You know, we're seeing even some of these so-called Christian colleges teaching some of these really dangerous ideologies. What are some signs that historically Christian universities and schools are capitulating to secular culture and some of these damaging ideologies? Well, you know, I think obviously there's a pressure that's coming, a pressure point that's coming from the government where, you know, the Department of Education, other agencies are, are constantly pressuring schools, both Christian and secular schools, uh, that if they're going to receive any assistance from or, you know, their students are going to receive any student loans from, financial aid from the government, that those schools are going to have to change what they do and change how they do it and all of those kinds of things. Obviously, for a lot of smaller schools, whether Christian or not, private, uh, private education, uh, that's a big pressure point because students come and we know that there's a huge, uh, you know, student loan crisis in our country today. Students are having to use that because of the escalating cost of, of, uh, of the academic experience. And so that's the way the government puts pressure on schools to, again, to give into a, a narrative, to give into a, um, you know, a worldview that would be counter to what, you know, as a follower of Christ that I would have, which is why go back to our earlier question, why the Christians need to stay engaged. They can't just sit back and say, well, I don't like either of these people, so therefore I'm going to go sit on the bench and, and not vote for anyone. We need to stay engaged because this does matter. And it matters at a local level. It matters at a national level. We need to focus on those kinds of things. And so with schools, you know, and there are some, to be honest with you, sadly, Christian schools that uh, have given into, they've changed their, their charters, they've changed their constitutions or bylaws to allow things that, that would run counter to, you know, what they started with and what they believed when they were founded. But let's be honest, we go back 400 years, Harvard was, Harvard was the same exact story. Started as a school to train Christian ministers. Um, Yale started to train Christian ministers. And of course, we know now, hundreds of years later, both of those schools have moved far away from their Christian perspective, far away from their Christian founding. We've got to make sure that we don't let that happen, not just to Liberty, but to the Christian schools that are in our country today, all of which are very, very important, whether small or large, every single one of them play an important part. Uh, they play a critical role in training up young people, both from Christian families as well as from secular fami families, to train them up to make a positive impact, a positive difference in our society and in our culture, to always focus on truth and not to let the government or any other outside entity push that school away from what they believe in. Absolutely. Now, there's no denying that the United States has been blessed. Do you believe in American exceptionalism, and how do you define that? Well, I think obviously America has been blessed. There's no question. You go back all the way back to the very founding of our nation and, you know, the fact that our nation is such a young nation in comparison to 
all of the other, the nations of Europe and Asia, the different, uh, the African continent. I mean, obviously we're a very new country. And you look at what we have been able to accomplish in a very short period of time, relatively, compared to all of the others, there's no question we've been blessed. Now, does that mean God loves America more than he loves other countries? Absolutely not. Uh, John 3, 16, I read it all the time. For God so loved the, not America, loved the world. And so while I do believe that you know America is an exceptional nation, we've been blessed beyond measure, I believe to whom much is given, much is required. And we have to make sure and recognize that yes, while we are an exceptional place, while America is a special, uh, you know, a very accomplished nation and we've been blessed beyond measure, that means that we need to do all that we can to take the resources that we have, the education that we have, the skills that we have, the, the money that we have, and we need to make a positive impact in countries around the world. And to do so from the perspective of, we wanna not come in as the big, you know, the big man on on the block, the big kid on the block, but we want to come in and we want to partner with and help you and to encourage you because again, we have a responsibility as I believe the greatest nation on the face of the earth to make sure that we are doing all that we can to bless others and to help others because that is what God has called us to do. Wonderful. Pastor Falwell, thank you so much. Thank you. Honored to be with you.